Yeshua was writing on the ground. Probably their names. Based off what Jeremiah 17 said. Which, you know, in itself is probably a miracle. Because he probably didn't know the names of everybody standing there. At least they didn't think he did. And he started writing their names in the dirt. So you don't think that's a little nerve-wracking right there? To all of a sudden see Yeshua writing your name in the dirt and you're going... That also means he had to be standing around him to see all that he was writing down. They're ready to stone that woman, but they saw their names more than likely being written in the dirt. And, and then they remembered what Jeremiah 17 said. And then they started backing off, uh, afraid at that time. Uh, a quick cor a coronavirus update. And we're still waiting to hear. Yesterday, supposedly, a lot more of the restrictions were released than Governor Ducey indicated that he things were getting suddenly getting worse. There's a lot more cases and death, but most of that was due to improper reporting. So when the proper reporting came in, the numbers increased drastically. So I don't think Governor Ducey rescinded his release yesterday for most things, as long as you maintain safe social distance. But I'm sure we need to watch it very close this coming week and, and see what's going on out there. And so the leadership and Pastor Anita and I have uh, wanted to take a slow approach to protect our people and minimize the risk. And so we're going to continue live streaming until we think it's safe for everybody to come in. Once it is, once it looks like it's going to happen, the leadership team will get together and we'll discuss how to reopen our facilities for service. Remember, we are always trying to protect you and minimize the risk at all times. We truly appreciate your patience and faithfulness. Greatly looking forward to gathering together again as Mishpocha, as family. We miss you, we love you, and continue to pray for you. May Adonai continue to bless you and protect you during this period of time. We are continuing with uh, Psalms, so you got your Bibles, I hope you do. Turn to Psalms 15. I'm sorry, uh, Psalms, yes, Psalms 15, I'm, that's right, I'm getting ahead of myself here, Psalms 15, it says here, verse 1, Lord, who shall abide in your tabernacle, who shall dwell in your holy hill, then he goes on to tell us what he expects of people, how they are supposed to act in order to abide in his tabernacle. For those of you who have been around for my tabernacle teachings, I teach that the tabernacle of Moses, as they call it, that you can read about in Exodus and, and, and Leviticus, it's all about the pathway to get right with God, the pathway to salvation and to eternal life. That's all the furniture, all the colors, all the curtains, everything in there is a pathway and how we are to live and what we are supposed to do. Just briefly, I'm going to go through it real quick here, just so that you know. There's only one door, because remember, the entire courtyard is covered by offensive curtains. There's only one door, and that door, those pillars that are, that are in that door holding those curtains up are set in brass sockets. Anytime a brass is present, that indicates judgment. So Yeshua said, I am the door. There's only one door, and it's Yeshua. There's no other way to God but through Yeshua. That's real evident in the tabernacle of Moses. Just inside that door is the brazen altar. That's made out of brass too, indicating judgment. It's on that altar that the blood atonements take place. And so, blood must be shed before you can go any further. Not your own, but the sacrifices. And we know that Yeshua was those sacrifices so you must today appropriate and grab a hold of what Yeshua did for you, the blood of the Messiah. Once you do that, you get past the brazen altar. Now you're in what they call the outer court. The outer court is the biggest court of all. And there is a difference between the outer court and the inner court. The outer court is salvation. That's what it's all about. It's salvation. 300 square cubics, the outer court. Three is the number of resurrection. So everybody that's in the outer court will be resurrected. And that includes the inner court too. So how do you get in the inner court? How do you actually get in the presence of God? 
the verse 1 of Psalms 15 says, Who shall abide in the tabernacle? Who shall dwell in your holy hill? Folks, we want to dwell in this holy hill. We want to get as close as we can to God in his tabernacle. So how do you get that other than being an outer court believer? We want to be an inner court believer. There's one piece of furniture that stands between the outer court and inner court. And that one piece of furniture is a brazen labor. Again, made out of brass, indicating judgment. But it's filled with water. And the priests were required to wash in it before they entered the inner court. Any priest that failed to wash in it would be struck dead if they stepped into the inner court. This fits the parables of Yeshua all over the place, the concept of having getting coming in, like the parable of the ten virgins. Five of the wise ones entered in the door, then the door was closed, and the five foolish ones were left out. Then there was a man without the wedding garment on who got inside. He didn't come from hell. He was in the outer court, and he snuck into the inner court without his wedding garments on. That's where the married supper of the Lamb would take place, is the inner court. And when they saw him without his wedding garments on, they threw him out. So we want to enter the inner court. That is for the bride of the Messiah. That's the kingdom principles. That's why Yeshua taught many times over and over again. The kingdom of God is like, is like, is like. It's action-oriented things. Salvation is a free gift of God. That's the brazen altar. That's the outer court. But once you are saved, you are called to do righteous deeds. So what are we doing? What are we doing that allow us to go become inner court believers? It's very important to understand. Once you wash at the brazen labor, which symbolizes repentance, washing of the word, and the Holy Spirit. Once you do that, you can enter into the inner court. And the door of the inner court also sets in brass sockets, indicating judgment against those who enter improperly. But once you've washed at the brazen labor, you will be allowed to enter. When you get inside, you look to the left is the golden menorah. But Yeshua said, we are the light of the world. He is the light of the world. For those that all enter that door into the inner court, you better be letting your light shine till the world knows who you are. God does not like secret believers. You cannot do it. Let your light shine. Don't put your light and bury it under a bush. Let your light shine. To the left is the table of showbread. There you have fellowship with other priests eating the bread. It also indicates covenant because there is also wine and oil present on that table too, the table of showbread, the golden table of showbread. It indicates fellowship with God and with other people. In the center is the golden altar. The golden altar represents prayers of the saints that rise up before the Ark of the Covenant, before God himself. Those who enter the inner court are expected to be prayer warriors and to pray. Well, I don't like to pray. Then, then you may not be an inner court believer. You may be an outer court believer. I don't understand why we don't see more people here on Thursday nights for prayer. Inner court, peop, court believers pray. That's what's important. And so you pray, and your prayers rise up before God, and it's like sweet-smelling incense to him when you pray. When you pray according to the pattern that he has set, set up. Even in the Psalms, we just read them recently, that King David said there's a pattern in which you are to pray. You know, and that's why the Lord gave us the Lord's Prayer. It's a pattern. You know, it doesn't mean you just keep saying the same prayer over and over again in a rote concept. That's not what it's talking about. But there's a certain order of giving God praise and glory and trust and faith in Him. And sometimes, folks, it's no more than just opening up your heart to Him. And just calling out to Him going, Help! Help me, Lord! You know, that humble heart, that when you surrender your heart and it's humble before God, that's sometimes all we got to do. He senses that. He senses your humility. And he knows that you're reaching out to him. That's what he wants to hear from us. And also in the inner court, you have the Ark of the Covenant where God dwells. Ark of the Covenant, that golden ark. And inside that golden ark are the Ten Commandments. So when you are saved and you're an inner court dweller and you come in the presence of God, his Ten Commandments are written upon your heart. They're part of your life. If you have the Holy Spirit... 
then God is dwelling in you. You become an Ark of the Covenant with God's laws written upon your heart. That's a whole concept of the Tabernacle of Moses and all the different curtains that come up on it, even on the outside. Inside are, are panels of gold and reflection goes everywhere inside the inner court. It's lit up. That's why we read in Revelation, has no need of the sun because even just the light of the menorah lights the place up many ways. Then the outer coverings that go over the tabernacle. The ram skin dyed red, indicating atonement. Eventually it's all covered by dark badger skins. They don't know that particular Hebrew, Hebrew word, whether it's badgers, but it's some kind of skin off of an animal, and they cover that with the skin of the animal to waterproof it and to protect it from storms and rain and wind and sand and dirt. Another thing about that is people that are not believers can look far away and, they, and all they see is this dark skin covering over the tabernacle and they think, what's so special about that place? That's the way God does it. He protects his saints. He, he watches his saints and protects them against the elements of the world. And the people in the world don't desire it unless they humble their hearts and want to come in through the door of the tabernacle itself. God has a reason and a pattern for all these things in the tabernacle. Wow. Bless the Lord. It is a way to salvation. Remember in John 1, 47, Yeshua was gathering his disciples just now currently gathering his disciples. One of them was called Nathaniel. And Yeshua said, he looked from a distance and saw Nathaniel sitting under a fig tree. And said, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. What does that mean, no guile? This means that he was a good, righteous Israelite. And God called him to be a disciple. Nathaniel. So when people say, well, without, without Jesus, you, you know, you're in trouble. Well, yes, you are in trouble. But Nathaniel was one of the rare ones that followed the commandments of God before he knew Yeshua. In him is no guile. So Yeshua approached him and said, follow me. So Nathaniel, a righteous Israelite, began to follow Yeshua. So what does it mean there is no guile? The concepts are that the person's honest, he's just, he's faithful, he's righteous, he walks in the commandments, he's truthful, he prays, he does good to all. That's what it means by having no guile. You know, do we do that? Are we like Nathaniel? Can we walk like Nathaniel? Do we have those attributes of Nathaniel so that Yeshua gathers us as a disciple? Remember the 12 apostles end up being the 12 foundation of the new city of Jerusalem? Nathaniel was one of them. Verse 2, Psalms 15. He that walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. So now we're going to go through a list that's just in the Psalms itself. How you abide in the tabernacle of God and how you dwell in the holy hill. He that walks uprightly works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. Wow, there's a lot to be said about those. Isaiah 32, verse 6 says, Israel was, God was speaking against Israel. He says, you are like cisterns that have holes in it that holds no water. Like clay pots that are cracked and have holes in them and hold no water. What good is a clay pot that doesn't hold any water or wine or anything else that's liquid in it? you got cracks and holes in it, so what spiritually speaking, what Isaiah is saying here, that we are the clay pots. We are the clay. God is the potter. He forms us. And if we do things we're not supposed to be, we got holes and cracks in our pots. Which means we cannot hold anything that's important to God until we fix those holes and cracks in us. Wow. 1 Peter 2.17 says we are to honor all men. We are to love the brothers, fear God, and honor the king. Wow. What king? 
Well, I guess that means we don't rebel against those who have authority over us. That's a, that's a good concept. I mean, when we live in a democracy like we do in the United States, we have a certain right to vote the way we want things to be voted for the way of God. But outside of that, we have no right to badmouth or tear up dignitaries. So we have to be careful about that. Romans 13, 7 says, Render unto all that is due. We can't have bad tongues. We can't act like we have no salt that's worth its flavor. All these kind of concepts we have to be careful about. Verse 3. He that backbites not with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his neighbor. These are all things about who shall abide in the tabernacle of God, who shall dwell in his holy hill. These are all concepts. You don't use your tongue to do evil. You don't do evil to your neighbor, nor take up a reproach against your neighbor. Live peacefully with all those around you. It's what the scripture says to do. We must do those things. In verse 4, In whose eyes a vile person is contemned. Uh, that means uh, we are to abhor vile people. So if you want to enter the tabernacle and dwell in the holy hill, you are to abhor evil people and honor them that fear the Lord. He that swears to his own hurt and changes not. This means that you, 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 you control your own evil and change not. In other words, walk in righteousness, control your own evil, restrain the evil in you and walk in righteousness. That's what this is talking about. So you are not to hang around with vile people. Why? Why are we to hang around with vile evil? That's what the vile means is evil. Evil people. Why are we not to hang around evil people? Because you'll get drugged into their evil ideas and thoughts. You're not supposed to hang around people like that. Verse 5. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that does these things shall never be moved. In other words, the very last line, he that does these things I just spoke about, shall never be moved. In other words, slip, decay, shaken, or fall. God said, if you follow these things I just said in Psalms 15, you will not fall. You will not slip. You will not be shaken or decay. This is what this means. When you walk this way, God will uphold you at all times. So you do not put money to usury. What is usury? That's wrongful gains like loan sharks that bite and bribery and stuff like this. You're desperate, you know, for money in order to try to stay afloat. And God speaks against souls to take advantage of that. We're not talking about bank loans, you know, and stuff like that where you see what you've got. We're talking about these kind of people that want to, you know, take from you and, a whole and everything you even got, like... All right, I'll loan you this money, but you're going to sign your house over to me. If you don't pay it off, I'm taking your house. This is the kind of stuff we're talking about. God hates that kind of usury, that kind of concepts in the Bible where people take advantage of people and try to take everything they got. God hates that. Now we're going to go to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. This is known as the Miktam of David. Some scholars say that means golden or cover, precious, more than gold. Some scholars say this whole Psalms is about the Messiah, Messiah himself. Other scholars say some parts of it is and some part isn't about the Messiah. I'll let you decide that. So verse 1, O my soul, you have said unto the Lord, you are my Lord, my goodness it sends not to thee. That's a bad translation. It's better if it says uh, concepts that, you know, there is no goodness without you. I have no goodness beside you. Other translations, that's the way they translate that. I didn't understand the King James Version. You are my Lord. My goodness extends not to, to thee. <coughs> Our goodness depends on the Lord. 
That's basically what it's saying. Don't ever think that your goodness will get you places with God. You must understand that. It's the Lord goodness toward us that gets us in favor of him when we receive that. And then we try to walk in the best goodness that we can. And then we find favor with God. You know, the Bible, John tells us that, and 1 John tells us, anyone who says they have not sinned is a liar. So even as a believer, we make mistakes, serious mistakes sometimes. But God's looking at the heart. Do you humble yourself and you cry out to him and you follow him and you pray? Those are very important concepts. Verse 3. But to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. Verse 3 is, here is saying that the, the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent also in whom is all my delight. If you are a saint and you call upon the name of the Lord, he delights in you. He delights in you. Do you not know that God delights in you? We beat ourselves up many, many times. God just wants to hear our cry out to him. God wants to hear us say, I'm sorry. God wants us to turn. But he delights in us. We are his. We are his children. How many fathers, good fathers anyway, out there that failed to delight in their children? If you're a father, you better be delighting in your children. God the Father is the same way. He delights in his children. How do you become a child of his? By your faith and by the Holy Spirit. That's how you become a child unto him. Because the Bible says, His Spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you are indeed a son and daughter of God. That's how you are a child. Not every human being is a child of God. The world likes to think that. But that's not what it is. When you have the Holy Spirit and His Spirit is bearing witness with your spirit, then you are a child of God. Just not every Tom, Dick, and Harry that's out there. Got to understand that. The world says one thing. God says something else. You want to be a child of God? Then you better have the right relationship with God. That's how you become a child of God. Just because you were born does not make you a child of God. And the world teaches that kind of nonsense all the time. That's not true. So we need to understand those things. Those who love God will love those who also love God. So when you're around other believers and other saints, you need to love them. You need to love them and not criticize them and say terrible things about them. You can't do things like that. Don't be negative about believers. And don't fail to see the excellent in the saints themselves. Love others, especially of the household of God. That's what Paul told us. Especially of the household of God. The Lord delights in us, King David. If you look at it, maybe the King David just saying that. He delights in the saints also. The King David had a heart after God's own heart. Verse 4, their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names unto my lip. Wow. We must resolve to have fellowship with those who have, or no fellowship with those who have unfruitful works of darkness. You know, people who drink and take blood like a lot of pagans do, they think they're somehow or another taking on the spirit of the animal of the blood that they're drinking. This was a real problem we had even in America by the American Indians, drinking blood and thinking it gives them, drinking the blood of a buffalo and think they got the strength of a buffalo. That's nonsense. That's paganism to do stuff like that. That's what God says, do not eat or drink blood. He says at least twice in the Old Covenant and once in the New you don't do those things. It's a, it's a pagan concept to eat and drink blood. The Bible, Leviticus 17, says, I have given the blood for your atonement. That blood belongs to the Lord. Now, a lot of you know that I am a hunter. I like to hunt. And there's a scripture, and it also says that when you kill an animal, 
Because you are not to just spill the blood on the ground. You are to drain the blood on the ground and then cover it up. Very interesting. So I'm cognitive of that all the time. Then cover it up. Cover up the blood. The blood is precious to the Lord. For it is, a, it is the life of the flesh, the Bible says. Blood is very important, as all of you know. You, we're all glad we got blood in us. But you know when you get resurrected, you'll have no more blood. You will have physical form where you can be touched, but you'll have no blood in you. You'll have flesh and physical touch in the resurrected, incorruptible body, but no blood in you. There's never any about anything about blood spoken in those in the resurrection at all. Wow. John 6 tells us that in that story of John 6 when he had the multitudes gathered together, together at Galilee he says Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall have no fellowship with me. And all the people got up and left. <coughs> they didn't understand what he was saying. They, they all knew that you're not, they're not supposed to eat human flesh and drink blood. But they, didn't, they failed to look at it spiritually. What Yeshua was talking about was what we call the New Covenant Passover today. The bread and the wine concept. But he was testing them because most of them were following him because he was waiting for the next miracle so they could be entertained by the miracles and maybe Yeshua will provide some more food for them like he did with the fish and loaves. So as soon as he said, unless you eat of my flesh and drink my blood, you shall have no part of me. So all the people said, oh, I don't agree with that. I'm out of here. And all these people left. So Yeshua looked over to the disciples and said, will you leave too? And Peter looked at him and said, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Where will we go? That's a great line. Where will we go? Where else should we turn? Who else should we follow? The Lord knew what he was doing, knew what he was saying. And Peter was right. Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go? Folks, we cannot go anywhere else. Just him. It's the only place we can go. We cannot go anywhere else. But through Yeshua in our lives. Verse 5. The Lord is a portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. You maintain my lot. Interesting scripture. The Lord is a portion of my inheritance. So whether you look at this as Yeshua or you look at a King David, what it's basically saying is that you have determined a lot or a portion or, or a future promise for either David or Yeshua to follow. And they're just saying that you're, the Lord is a portion of my inheritance. Folks, our inheritance has everything to do with the Lord. What he determined for us is everything. If he determined for us in eternal life and to live in the new Jerusalem, it's everything. He determines that. You maintain my lot. That word lot is talking about, you know, the stones where you put in and you choose a lot, you know, like you're, you're, you're you know, determining what the Lord wants to say like that. In other words, it's been already determined what your lot is to be. It's already determined what your portion is going to be. It's the same concept as what happened in uh, Numbers 18, verse 20 and 21, where God told the Levites, they're not getting any land. They're not getting any land for you are my portion. I am your inheritance. This is what the Lord told the Levites when they were dividing up the land. You will get this, you'll get that, and all the different tribes. But the Levites say, you don't get any land. I'll give you some Levitical cities all around Israel so you can minister to the people. But you really don't get any land. For you are my inheritance. I am your portion. Folks, can you say that? Can you say that God is my inheritance? God is my portion? 
We're not a people that's looking for land. We are a people that's looking for a city not built by the hands of God. A city built by the hands of, I mean, hands of man. We're looking for a city built by the hands of God. That's our portion. That's inheritance. Nothing on this earth. Nothing on this earth. So when we strive and we strive and we strive and we try to, you know, earn, earn and, and build wealth and riches and stuff for things on the earth, that's not our portion. That's not our lot. Yeshua is our lot. He is our inheritance. And Him do we trust. And He's already out there building a place for us. A place not built by the hands of man. He's building a mansion for us. That's where our inheritance is. So why do we fret so much on this earth what we have and don't have? That leads to covetousness if we're not careful. Or leads to striving for things that are not of God. And becomes our whole purpose in life to strive for things that are not of God. The Lord is our inheritance. He is our inheritance. He's given us a will already that he signed by his own blood. And said, this is your inheritance. You will be mine. I will give you eternal life. I'll give you a place to dwell in heavenly places. That's our inheritance that we desire and that we should know that we should get. Wow. Goes on to say, the lions have fallen unto me in pleasant places. Verse 5. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. The lions are fallen unto me. This is talking about the appointments and the portions are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Do you not know that the place that God has got for you is about as pleasant as pleasant could ever be? The scripture says, Eyes have not seen, nor has ears heard of the things that God has for those that, what? Love him. So if you don't love the Lord, all bets are off. If you treat the Lord only as a sugar daddy, or I think I just go play it safe, all bets are off. If you love him, eyes have not seen nor ears have heard of the things that God has for those who love him. That's our portion. That's our inheritance. That's why we look up to the sky. King David says, I will look up when he prays. Because he knew what his inheritance was. He knew what his portion was. When you can see down the line at the end of the line here, on the other side of the valley at the mountain of the Lord, and you can see... I will dwell there. That will be my home. It surely makes walking through the valley a whole lot easier. You know, snake, get away from me. Scorpion, get away from me. Centipede, thorns, get out of the way. I have a purpose walking through this valley. I'm getting to the mountain. I want to get to the mountain. The mountain is my goal. The mountain is my portion. The mountain is my inheritance. If you stand back and go, I ain't crossing that valley. That's an ugly looking valley. Did you see all them bugs in there? I'm not doing that. That should not be our concern. Keep your eyes on the mountain and God will lead you through the valley of all those critters and thorns that try to keep you away. There is a path. There is always a path when led by Yeshua. You can look at it and it looks like there's no way through. But when you grab the hand of the Lord and walk with him, he will show you a path through it all to get to the mountain, folks. Even right now, this coronavirus you know, is a huge obstacle for people. Do you not know the Lord will guide you through that? Do you take his hand? It's very, very important. So no matter what we suffer, no matter what we go through, we must understand our portion is the Lord's, our inheritance is the Lord's. He will lead us through those valleys. He will keep the snakes away from us and the scorpions away from us and the thorns. How many of you not know, I'm sure you do, almost every desert plant out there here in Arizona has got thorns on it. We really, we got a thorny place around here. So we have to be careful or we get, you know, poked all over the place. But God... That should never keep us away from God. That should never keep us away from the holy mountain that we seek. Amen? Amen. Wow. 
Verse 7. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. The Lord is our counsel. He is our caring one. He is our counsel. Why do we listen to other people? Listen to the Lord. He is our counsel. Wow. My reins also instruct me in the night. That reins is talking about the seat of emotions in us. Instruct me in the night. When things are hard in the night. King James says night seasons. That's not right. The only word there is night. I don't know why they said night season. That confuses the scripture. But in the night. In other words, when you're having a hard time, you're, you're walking in, in, in darkness, you know, not, not, not in a sinful way, but everything around you seems to be closing in on you. He is our counsel, even in times like that. Particularly in times like that, you need to call upon him at all times. He, so during those times, he will instruct us, even in the night. When there seems to be no answer. When the, no light is shining upon us. He will instruct us. Even in the midnight hour. Whatever. When you let the Lord instruct you. Even in your darkest hour. You will find hope. We are not a people that are hopeless. My gosh people. Look what awaits us. We are not a hopeless people. Don't live in hopelessness. Not at all. Verse 8, these next few scriptures are particularly about the Messiah. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. All right, verse 8, what does that mean? He, we, we shall not be moved. What is he talking about here? Paul in Acts 13.35 quotes these scriptures. Peter in Acts 2, 25 through 28, quotes these scriptures. And both Paul and Peter says they are about the Messiah. That's why we know these scriptures for sure are all about the Messiah taking place here. I've set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. It's like God speaking, God the Father speaking. And so Messiah is almost re repeating back that he shall not be moved. What that means, he will accomplish that which was intended. It is finished, Christ said on the cross. Nobody was going to stop him from completing what his purpose was, that the Father was leading him to do. Did you know it pleased the Father to bruise him? Yeshua himself said, I laid down my life. The Romans didn't kill him. The Jews didn't kill him. Yeshua killed himself. The Father killed him. You know how much evil has been done because they thought the Jews had killed him. The Jews were just players in this whole concept of salvation God was setting up. It wasn't the Jews' fault. It was purpose that Yeshua was going to come and die in the house of his friends to fulfill scriptures. He had to come as a Lamb of God. And his purpose was not going to be moved. It was not going to be changed. How many times could Yeshua have escaped that? He chose not to because that's what he came for. He came to die as the Lamb of God. And thank God he did. And thank God he did not change his mind. He was not going to be moved. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was calling out to the Father in his darkest hour. But he said, nonetheless... Not my will, but yours, Father. And he followed through with what he had to do. Of course, any, you know, you got to understand, Jesus was also fully human as well as fully God. And so the human part of him was really quite concerned to what he was getting ready to have to go through. But nonetheless, he shall not be moved. Can we say that? I shall not be moved? Shall we say I shall not be moved from the purposes and the portion that God has called us to do? We shall not be moved. We sing a song like that. We, we don't say that just to sing cute little songs. We mean it. We shall not be moved. Wow. 
Because he's at my right hand. You see these scriptures in Isaiah 42, verse 4, and Hebrews 12, 2. That he will be at the right hand of the throne of God. It was planned for Yeshua to die and then ascend to the right hand of the Father. He's there today atoning for all who call upon his name. He's sitting there at the throne of God on the right side. And every time somebody calls up and says, Yeshua, Yeshua, forgive me. I need you. Yeshua forgives. Because he's sitting on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. He forgives at that time. He doesn't put any more blood on the Ark. It's a done deal already. But he acknowledges it. And it's a propitiation of what he has done. It will be completed when you call upon him. But there's a day where the Father will get off the throne. And Yeshua will sit on the throne. Some people likened it like Yeshua just scoots over and morphs in with the Father. I don't know if that's the way it's going to be. That's an interesting concept. But once he gets on the throne in full control, he is now the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and atonement is over. Atonement's over at that time. Once he becomes the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the, all the heavens are going to open up. That's a sign of the Son of Man. And the sign of the Son of Man is going to appear upon the whole earth at that time. Atonement is now over at that point. Now it's just a fearful day of the second coming of the Messiah to rid the land of the wicked that are on the face of this earth so he can create a righteous earth for people to live on it for a thousand years. But despite that, evil will come back. Evil will come back after a thousand years because he locks up Satan during that time, but then he lets him out again. So that all the people that are born during that time on the thousand year millennial earth will now have to make a choice now too. God or Satan. But we who consider ourselves the first fruits in the first resurrection today we will already be resurrected and will be with the Lord. So when he comes down we're coming with him. Wow. We're coming with him. To rid the land of the wicked in the land. Verse 9. Therefore my heart is glad. Is your heart glad? And my glory rejoices. And my flesh shall rest in hope. Yeshua's heart was glad. Do you not know his heart was glad? You can read it when in his resurrection. He went down to the Sea of Galilee. And cooked breakfast for his disciples. And told them which way to throw their nets in the water to get fish. Yeshua's heart was glad. Our heart should be glad. All the time in the Lord. And my glory rejoices. And my flesh shall also rest in hope. What he is saying here that Yeshua knew he was going to die. He knew he was going to die. But he also knew he was going to rise again. So he, his flesh rested in hope. Until that resurrection three days later. Do you rest in hope? Do you rest in hope? Do you know that Yeshua is coming for you? Do we rest in hope? He is our hope. He is our life. He is our resurrection. He is the truth. All these concepts. He is our hope. So if he is our hope. Then we know where we put our hope. And we put our hope in him at all times. Verse 10. For you will not leave my soul in hell. It's not talking about King David. I mean that particular part could be. But not what we're going to see in the next, verse, or next uh, lines or two after. Yeshua went to hell when he died. Did you know that? He went to hell when he died. Not because he was bad, but he went down there to, to deliver the captives that were in hell. He went down to deliver all the righteous saints before him that were down there waiting to see his day. Abraham looked for his day. Abraham was down there at Abraham's bosom in that part of hell 
He wasn't suffering. He was doing fine down there. But waiting for the Messiah to show up to be delivered out of that place and brought up to the kingdom of God. Yeshua went down to hell to deliver, not because Yeshua did anything wrong. It says on the next line, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. David saw corruption. David was buried and went back to ashes to ashes and dust to dust, but not Yeshua. That's why we know this is about Yeshua. You want to witness the people, Jewish people in particular about that? Show them these scriptures. Show it to you. David was corrupted. He disintegrated. He went back to dust. Not Yeshua. Yeshua rose from the dead three days after he was buried. He did not see corruption. Verse 11. Will you show me the path of life? Thou, you will show me the path of life. He is our life. Yeshua is our life. He shows us the path. I just told you a while ago, the path of the tabernacle. That's the path that we need to watch after and follow. Will you show me the path of life? In your presence is the fullness of joy. 